Hey everyone, Pastor Grant here. We're so glad that you made the decision to join us for this message. And uh, we're expectant that together we would encounter the living God during this time. We as a staff and as a church are praying that this resource would help each of us grow in our faith as we take our next steps in the journey with Jesus. So be encouraged as we open God's Word today. For those of you who may be new to Summit or maybe you've started attending in the last three or four months, you probably have no idea who I am. <laughs> My name is Kelsey. I'm one of the pastors here and I've been on maternity leave for the last three months and I've just been spending every second of my day with this cutie right here. I know. This is Clayton. He was born in November and he is just the absolute joy of my life. It has been a blast to just get to be his mom. And I just got to spend the last three months at home with him and my husband. And let's just say it has been a wild ride to say the least. Um, the first night that we brought Clayton home from the hospital, we were just like so excited to be home. And we happened to live across the street and next door to some of our just dearest friends. And I remember we got home from the hospital and they were like the first people to meet our son. We were so excited for them to meet him. They came over and we just like celebrated and shared in the joy of just bringing him home. My husband and I got ready for bed. We took out this like massive stack of paperwork the hospital had given us and just like set it on the table to look through at another time and we put Clayton down to bed and we got into bed and, and just were completely oblivious to what the night would bring. So let's just say I have never heard someone cry so much in my entire life and we were just at our wits end, right? He was crying, and, and it was like the entire night, we just could not figure out what was wrong. We bounced him. We rocked him. We fed him. We changed him. We did everything that we could think of, and the whole night, my husband and I were just staring at each other, delirious, like, what else could possibly be wrong? Just asking each other questions we did not know the answer to. Is he too hot? Is he too cold? Right? Does he need his diaper changed? Could he possibly be hungry again? Right? just all through the night, just staring at each other, having no idea how to respond to him. And I remember, I just have this vivid memory of sitting on the edge of my bed, holding Clayton, just sobbing and, and snot just dripping from my nose onto my poor child's face. And I'm crying and he's crying and we have no idea what to do. And it was just a crash course into motherhood. We didn't go to sleep that night until, well, that morning until 7 a.m., so we got a few hours of sleep, woke up, and I thought to myself, okay, I should probably like go through some of this paperwork the hospital gave us. We started rifling through it, and there's this like bright green flyer, and I pull it out, and on the top of the flyer, it just says, what to expect your first night home with baby. <laughs> so really glad I read that on night two, right? But that was just, uh, just some of the evidence in my life that our God does have a sense of humor. And if you are at all doubting that, you can just come see me after service. <laughs> Today, we are continuing on in our series, Who is This Man? And I was kind of thinking about this series um, over the course of the last couple months because that night I quickly learned that I could not control right, whether or not my kid was crying. The only thing I can control is how I respond to him. And so over those past few months, I have found myself praying, God, help me respond to Clayton the way you respond to me. And as I was studying for this sermon and we've been reading through the book of Luke, it's begged the question, well, how does God respond to us? How does he respond to me? Right On our worst days, when we're at our lowest, when we're up in the middle of the night, crying, lost, not knowing where to turn, how does he respond to us? On our best days, when we're working faithfully, right? We're doing what God has asked us to do. We are accomplishing what has been set before us. How does he respond to us then? So as we continue on in this teaching series today, we are going to be looking at Luke chapter 15. And the first couple of verses of this chapter give us a little bit of context of what's happening. It reads this. It says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. 
This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So this chapter, it begins with an accusation, right? The Pharisees and the teachers of religious law, they notice that Jesus is hanging out with, as Pastor Roy would say, the least, the last, and the lowest, right? The Pharisees and the teachers of religious law, they are supposed to be the most righteous and the most law-abiding. They are like the top tier Jews of the time, the cream of the crop. And they hated that Jesus hung out with tax collectors and sinners. So how did Jesus respond to this accusation? How did he respond to the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law? And then also, how did he respond to those tax collectors and sinners? What was the posture of his heart? Why did he share a table with them, share a meal with them? Well, in this chapter, Jesus reveals his intentions by telling three parables. And each of these parables kind of builds one on top of the other. And it just kind of slowly starts to escalate the more Jesus tells the story. So I'm going to read through all of these parables, and it may seem like a lot, but Jesus is really intentional in that he tells one story right after the other, just trying to hammer home some of his main points. So we're going to be in Luke 15, starting in verse 3. And this is what Jesus tells the Pharisees and the tax collectors while they're complaining about who he's hanging out with. He says this, If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, Hey, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and her neighbors and say, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his two sons. Well, a few days later, this younger son packed up all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and and I'll say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf that we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for the son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, 
the older son, he was in the fields working. And when he returned home, he heard music and, and, and saw dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told. And your father has killed the fattened calf for him. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and, and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing that you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf? His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. By the end of this, I wonder if the Pharisees looked at Jesus and just said, okay, we get it, all right? You don't have to keep going on and on and on. Jesus, he tells these parables and, and he responds to their accusation with not one, right? Not two, but three of these stories. And they're very repetitive. You probably noticed as we were reading through them, something or someone gets lost, right? Something or someone is found and then everybody rejoices. Like that's the gist of the story. So Jesus told these parables again and again and again because he wanted to make sure that the Pharisees got a very clear picture of what he was saying. He wanted to make sure the Pharisees understood why he was responding to the tax collectors and sinners the way that he was, right? And so when we look at these parables, there are three ways that we see God responding to us. The first way is that God seeks the lost. God seeks the lost. In the parable of the lost sheep, the shepherd left the 99 to seek out the one sheep who was lost. And in the parable of the lost coin, the woman lit a lamp, swept the house, and searched carefully until she found her coin. In the parable of the lost son, the father, from a long way off, ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Now, I want to draw your attention to something. We cannot lose what does not belong to us. Something our previous pastor Brad would say is he would remind us that the gospel does not start in Genesis 3, but it starts in Genesis 1. We were created in the image of God to be in relationship with God in the presence of God. We were meant to live with him in the garden forever, and our sin is what separated us from that. We were not always lost. Once that sheep was in the flock, once that coin was in the widow's hand, once that son was home, we lived in the garden. But sin caused us to separate ourselves from him. We could no longer be in the holy presence of God as sinful, broken beings. So we left the garden. We left the flock. We left her hand. We left home. The lost son did all he could to satisfy himself away from home, right? He took everything his father had offered him. He packed up his belongings. He spent all of his money. He moved to a distant land, all in the hopes that distance would offer what home could not. And where did it land him? Right? He was broke and starving. It led him to feeding pigs, which as a Jew, he was compromising his faith to have that job. Right, Because pigs were seen as unclean animals. And even the food that he fed to the pigs was appealing to him. He desired it. That's how hungry and how in need he was. The shepherd, he was not satisfied that he still had 99 other sheep. The widow was not satisfied that she still had nine other coins. The father was not satisfied that he still had one son. The shepherd left. The widow searched, and the father ran. God seeks the lost. The second way that he responds to us is God invites repentance. 
To repent means to turn our hearts away from our love of our sin and back toward loving our God. And I love how Jesus, he's not at all subtle when he tells these parables that he is is asking and inviting repentance. He says it over and over again in verse 7. After the parable of the lost sheep, he says this, In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents. And returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. In the parable of the lost coin in verse 10, he says, In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. And and I think that we see this too in the parable of the lost son in the father's posture towards his son. Right in verse 18, when the son is kind of reciting to himself what he's going to say, he says, oh, I will go home to my father and I'll say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming and filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. In this culture, for the younger son to demand his inheritance before his father was gone was extremely offensive. But then to even take that inheritance and leave his father and just blow through everything that he was given, that was a complete rejection of his family. It was dishonoring to his father. The younger brother's actions, it was no small thing. To return to his father's house was a bold move. And he's thinking to himself, you know, maybe, just maybe, his dad will take him back as an employee. Like that is his hope. Not even that he would return to relationship with his father as a son, but maybe he will just hire me as an employee. At least he would get fed and he would have a warm place to sleep. How many of you when you're about to go have like a hard conversation, you recite over and over again in your head what you're going to say? Yeah, okay, (laughs) me too. I do this all the time. I'll just go over and over what I'm going to say and how I'm going to say it and kind of just talk to myself. And sometimes I get so lost in my own thoughts and in my own head that I'm not totally sure if I've been talking out loud or not. My uh, my desk mates could tell me. (laughs) I imagine that this is kind of what the son was doing on his way home right? He's talking to himself. He has a long trip to go, and he's repeating over and over, okay, this is what I'm going to say to my dad. This is how this conversation is going to go. I'm just going to say, okay, look, dad, I know I've messed up. I know I've dishonored you, but if you'll have me, I'll work. I'll work as a hired hand on your property. I'll do my job well. I'll work as hard as I can, I promise. I can imagine how his stomach must have just turned at his nerves, how his palms might have started to sweat at the idea of confronting his father. Like the guilt and shame that might have bubbled up in his chest, knowing that he was wrong and he had to go and confess and repent to his dad. The kind of questions he might have asked himself. Will my father take me up on my offer? Will he even want to see me? What if he refuses to talk to me? What if he slams the door in my face? What do I do then? Where do I go? I can only imagine what was going on in his mind on that long journey home. He had a long time to reflect on what he had done. And as he was nearing home, right, as the home that he grew up in, that he was so familiar with, just started kind of appearing in the distance. And maybe just the adrenaline and the nerves started just building up again. Something unexpected happened. His father runs. This wealthy landowner, right, this prestigious man who probably had a reputation to uphold amongst his staff and his neighbors and the town he lived in, he runs. Like, picture this with me. The kind of clothing that was typical for his class in this time period, he would have been wearing like long robes of fabric. For him to run, he would have had to hike up those clothes, exposing his legs, kicking up mud and dirt along the way. Like, this would not have been a proud moment for the dad. Like, this would have been a moment that would have brought on shame, that would have exposed him. But he took on that shame 
in order to remove the shame from his son of coming home and being able to welcome him back home to the family. The father could have seen his son coming from a long way off and he could have slammed the door shut. He could have refused him out of hand, not even giving him an opportunity to give the apology he had been reciting to himself. He could have done that and he would have fully been in the right. He would have been justified. And yet, when the son was a long way off, the father runs. He runs. It's not a jog. It's not a power walk. It's not a gentle, I'm trying to get to the open checkout stand at Target before the person next to me kind of hustle. Like, that's not what the father did. He ran. This was like an Olympic 500-meter dash toward his son who had offended him and dishonored him and hurt him and left him. He ran. And I love that in the story, the son, he's not even able to finish the apology that he had rehearsed, right? He, he was going to say, hey, I could just be a hired hand. He doesn't, he's not even able to get those words out before the, stop, the father just stops him right where he's saying. And he says, he calls his servants. He says, come, come. And this is where we get a picture of God's third response to us. And it's this, God celebrates our homecoming. When the shepherd returned with his lost sheep, one out of a hundred, he called his friends and his neighbors in to rejoice with him. When the widow found her lost coin, which was one-tenth of her life's savings, she called in her friends and neighbors to rejoice with her. And when the father's son returned home, one son of only two, he called all of his servants to celebrate that his son, who was once lost, was back home. And the father gave him his best robe, a ring for his finger, sandals for his feet, and he killed the fattened calf. That was a huge deal. They would have spent so much time fattening up this calf and saving it for a really special day, like a festival, maybe the Day of Atonement or something like that. And he killed it early, unexpected, to celebrate his son returning home, and they feasted together. As I mentioned earlier, Um, My husband and I just have this really unique privilege of living across the street and next door to just some of our dearest people. And these are the kind of friends who have become a family to us. And we have gotten to live life together. And the Lord has just blessed us so much with their friendship. And I feel like I've gotten just like the smallest taste of what it must have been like for the early church to live in that Christian community. And so when we came home from the hospital and we brought Clayton home, we couldn't wait to celebrate with these friends. Like we got home from the hospital and within 20 minutes, our friends were over and we were celebrating with them and talking and laughing and telling stories and just rejoicing that this son that we had all prayed for together was finally home. And I want you to pay just particular attention to how God celebrates our homecoming. God does not celebrate our homecoming in isolation. He celebrates it in community, right? In the parable of the lost sheep, Jesus describes joy in heaven over the repentant sinner. In the parable of the lost coin, he describes joy in the presence of God's angels over the repentant sinner. And in the parable of the lost son, he invites his whole household to celebrate his son's homecoming. It is with heavenly celebration at the forefront of our minds that Jesus then presents an opportunity to the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law that he's telling these stories to, right? He presents an opportunity for them to respond to the repentant sinner with joy rather than bitterness, right? The opportunity is seen really, really clearly in the older brother, Jesus extends the invitation to the Pharisees, and by extension, he's extending that invitation to us. I want to end our time together by asking you a question. Now that we know how God responds to us, how do you respond to God? Like, truthfully, how do you respond to God? Maybe you relate most to the youngest son, right? You have taken what you have been given and you have spent it all. You have distanced yourself from God. You have done everything in your power to find fulfillment and satisfaction away from home. 
but at the end of the day, you've struck out. The love that you've been chasing elsewhere has come up empty. The identity that you've sought from others has proved wanting, and the hope that you have put put in man has been dashed. Maybe you've considered coming home. You even showed up here today. But you're afraid of how your heavenly father will respond to you, how he will receive you. I mean, after all, everything that you've done, that's no small thing. Maybe you've, the fear of how he would respond to you has even it drove you to maybe barter with God, saying, okay, if you take me back, I promise I will do anything that you want. I, I don't even have to be a son. I can just be a hired hand. I'll do whatever you want for the kingdom. I'm yours, and I promise I won't ever go down that path again. And you start to barter with him. And if that's you, I want to encourage you with something. In this parable, the father gave all he had to his two sons. And when one son squandered it and returned home, empty-handed, ashamed, and repentant, did you notice what the father did? He gave him more. He gave him the best robe, a ring for his finger, sandals for his feet. He killed the fattened calf for him and feasted. When logic would dictate that the father should have withheld from his son, right? Maybe not trusted him with anything else since clearly he's proved that he's not trustworthy, not given him anything more, put up a barrier to protect him and his wealth and everything he had, not allowing for that relationship to be what it once was. When logic would dictate that's how the father might respond, he responded in overwhelming generosity and they celebrated Church, when a repentant sinner comes through our doors, right, someone we've been praying for, someone who has made a mess of their life and has returned with nothing to show for it, someone who was lost but now is found, how do you respond? Are you generously celebrating their return? Or are you withholding yourself from them? Telling yourself, you know what, you've really messed up. And you can be here, but you can be a hired hand. You can't be in a relationship in the same way you once were, right? Maybe you're telling yourself, you know what? They don't deserve to be a part of this community the way that they once were. They don't deserve to be in community with me. Maybe you're here today and you relate to the oldest brother. You're in the family right? And you haven't left home. You have been faithful and you've been working for the kingdom of God and you are seeking out his will faithfully in the workplace or at your schools or in your family. You've just been serving the Lord. The oldest son, he was so focused on what he was doing for his father that he forgot his relationship to his father. And maybe like him, your identity has become so much in what you are doing for God that you have forgotten who you are to God, who you are in God. So when a repentant sinner walks through those doors, you respond not with celebration and joy, remembering that you too were once lost, but you respond by measuring, right? Measuring what you've done for the kingdom versus what they've done or what they have failed to do, comparing your best days to their worst ones. Church, we must never allow the lie that we made ourselves who we are today room to grow in our heart. We must remember that we stand on the grace of God alone that we were not made right by our own actions and that we were made right only by the gracious and merciful actions of our Lord Jesus Christ. We must not forget that because Satan, oh boy, does he want you to forget that. Or maybe you find yourself like the servant. You've been faithfully serving your Lord and you've been celebrating your brothers and your sisters who have come through that door and every single morning you are preaching the gospel to yourself and you are remembering who you are in the Lord. And if that is you, if that's where you're at today, I want to encourage you, keep going. 
Keep loving people well. Keep faithfully serving. Don't be tempted to forget who you are in Christ. Wherever you're at today, Jesus is presenting an opportunity to you. He's inviting you to receive him. Like the younger brother receiving his father's embrace, maybe you need to return home repentant and just step into his arms. Or maybe, like the oldest, whose heart was hardened towards his younger brother, maybe you need to receive the invitation that this parable ends on. In verse 31 and 32, his father said to him, Look, dear son, everything I have is yours. You have always stayed by me. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and now is found. So will you stand outside the house grumbling and measuring yourself up against the lost? Or will you step into the joy of the Father and celebrate the homecoming of your brother. When we're presented with an invitation like this, it can be really tempting to just shut down, right? And move on and to not permit the kind of introspection that would expose maybe the gunk that we have built up in our heart, the shame or the bitterness or the pride. And and I want to invite you today and encourage you to step into it to lean into it. Maybe talk with those you came with and say, hey, you know, who did you relate to in this story? Talk about it. Don't ignore the Father's invitation because let me tell you, church, there is a celebration going on inside. Whoever believes that being a Christian is all about just, just grinding and not, doing, um, not having joy and just focusing on what you're doing and just being serious all the time is not reading the scriptures because, man, there's joy in the house of the Lord to be had. There's a celebration going on. And he's inviting you, come inside. Rejoice with me. Will you pray with me? Loving God, man, I thank you that you are a God of joy, that you are a God who rejoices with us, that you're not this stoic God who's unmoved by our emotions, but that you rejoice with us and that you invite us to experience your perfect joy. I just pray over all of us today, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would just work in our hearts and reveal maybe what we have been withholding, reveal any bitterness or anger, or reveal some unrepentant sin that we might have. Lord, and I I just pray that you will lead us into repentance. Scripture says your kindness leads us to repentance. And I pray that we respond to that today and remember who we are in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me? May you be men and women who rejoice over every lost brother and sister who walked through these doors. And may you be men and women who live every day in the gracious and free gift of Jesus Christ. I love you guys. We'll see you next week. It was good to be with you at Church Online this morning. My prayer is that you met Jesus in a personal and meaningful way. If there's something particular that drew your heart a little closer to him, we'd like to do what we can to make that more integral to your life. I'd like to suggest a few possible next steps for you. Connecting to a community group is one of the most helpful ways to strengthen your walk with Jesus. Another really meaningful step is baptism. Maybe you're feeling like you need some specific prayer. Possibly you're ready to step into serving here at Summit in some way. If you'll take a minute and complete an online connect card, a member of our team will contact you this week to continue that conversation. One option would be to listen to today's message again or one of the previous messages. They're all easily available online for you. As I mentioned already, we're highly committed to doing life together. We're convinced that being in community with others is the best way to keep your faith viable and strong. 
If you're local to Spokane, I want to invite you to join us here in person. If you've loved being a part of Summit Online, but you're not local, I encourage you to connect with a church family that's near you. Find a life-giving relationship with others. We love you. We pray that you have a great week in the Lord.